Fire to downtown High Rise sends five to hospital, including two firefighters. And tonight, we're learning that the people who live inside of this building are being told to find somewhere else to stay. Plus. <laughs> It's Halloween all over again in Comber as a family in mourning finds a special way to say goodbye. A cold night in Windsor. The snow is done, but the temperatures, well, they sure have dropped. Our Colette Kennedy has the full forecast tonight. I'm Chris Ensing. Thanks for watching. A breaking story that is developing as we speak. People living in a downtown high rise are being told to leave their home tonight. A 21 story building right in our core. It was evacuated this morning because of a fire in the parking garage. Dale Molnar standing by at the scene. You were there all day. Dale, what's the latest? Well, Chris, the uh, health unit has determined that this building must be evacuated because they still have not been able to re resume power here. So they're being told to evacuate all the people in this building due to lack of power, heat and water. Now, I'm not sure how many people live here, but of course it's in the hundreds. I asked the fire department that earlier today. Uh, they couldn't give me an exact figure. Earlier today, about uh, 40 people were over at the uh, 400 building. Uh, now, what they're doing over here is what happened was the, uh, the fire knocked out the power in the, in the basement. They were trying to vent the building today. Uh, still have no success in, re in getting the power back on. They don't think they'll be able to do that uh, before uh, the nightfall is here. So that's why they're setting up some cots and a reception center over at the WFCU Center. They're asking some people to go find uh, accommodations on their own. Uh, here's how it all started off with uh, fire alarms going off at 6.30 this morning. I'm just wearing like my nightgown and just my jacket and, and I got my bird right away. She's really cold. Maxine Janaki is one of about 200 people who rushed out into the cold wearing whatever they could. Some stayed in the apartment building, some went with friends and eventually Red Cross and the City Social Services Department took care of about 40 of them at the 400 building reception room. Uh, yeah, we're just trying to keep them comfortable, entertained. We've provided some coffee, beverages, um, you know, some uh, food and snacks for them. One of the people was taken away by ambulance for an unknown illness. Three people from the West Court building and two firefighters were taken to hospital to be treated for smoke inhalation. Their injuries were not considered serious. With our firefighters, there was some, uh, you know, some uh, abnormalities with their vital signs. So as a precautionary measure, measure, we're just having them checked out. In addition to having a couple firefighters, the uh, our staff are working in some extreme conditions today. It's quite cold, it's slippery, uh, so it, uh, it makes a tough situation even more tough. The residents say they were roused from their beds by a fire alarm but they thought it was just a drill at first because it goes off regularly. There the, the smoke, the, it was really bad. So uh, everyone came on the downstairs and uh, now we are waiting for like the last uh, three hours. You can see like we just run like this with uh, our like normal clothes and pajamas and stuff like this. People with dogs were sheltered in a transit Windsor bus. I have nowhere to go, so I'm waiting to see if Red Cross will uh, uh, hopefully get a hotel for us because uh, I need a, uh, somewhere for me and my dog to go. So we're waiting to hear back from them to see if they get the power up. If not, uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Now, I just spoke to Andrea Jijong from the uh, fire department a little while ago. She said the firefighters were treated and released. She doesn't have a, a word yet on the three residents uh, who were uh, taken out here for smoke inhalation, but once again, we're told uh, non-life-threatening injuries. Uh, now the courts, of course, is the West Court building. Courts were cancelled today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We'll see how long it takes to get all this uh, power and heat and everything back on, so we're not sure about the courthouse tomorrow either. Uh, the fire marshal was brought in to investigate to find out a cause of these two cars that were on fire in the uh, B2 of the basement, in the basement garage, parking garage here. Uh, right now, uh, as you can see behind me, Goyle Avenue is closed between Chatham and University. Uh, I would imagine that will stay for the rest of the night. And we're going to be here for a little more longer, uh, Chris, to see what else we can find out. And we'll be checking back in shortly. Chris? And thanks for this, Dale. Dale Molnar in a developing situation in our downtown core tonight. It was a sloppy morning on the roads, too. Overnight as well, this collision here closed the eastbound lanes of Highway 401 at Huron Church Road in Todd Lane for about three hours. It involved four tractor trailers and two motor vehicles. Luckily, there were no injuries reported. 
Essex OPP said they responded to more than 20 collisions in 24 hours, including a jackknife transport truck that closed down the 401 at Highway 3 for four hours last night. The head of Ontario's Nursing Association has a blistering criticism of Windsor's police force. Doris Grinspoon spoke to a graduate class at the University of Windsor today. She touched on a wide range of issues facing nurses and candidly shared her opinion on the disappointment with Windsor's police service. Grinspoon says it is shameful Windsor remains the only municipality in Ontario that doesn't equip its officers to carry naloxone as part of their kits. Only one word, shame. I am sorry. It's shameful, uh, and it's shameful also that everybody's ready to move on with consumption services, and that it is the mayor that is not moving with that, and we need now the police chief to take, uh, to take the leadership that she has earned with this position, because just last week you had two alerts, one from the hospital, Right, and one from the public health unit with seven people that almost lost their lives. These lives are um, people that we know. Grinspoon said she is requesting a meeting with Chief Pam Mizuno. We asked Windsor Police if we could speak with Mizuno. They denied our request, saying that she has no new information to add to the conversation at this time. Across the river in Detroit, doctors at Henry Ford Hospital have performed what they believe to be the first of its kind in the United States, a double lung transplant on a 17-year-old patient as a result of a vaping-related illness. The teen was admitted to the hospital with what was at first believed to be pneumonia. He continued to have breathing problems and was put on life support. Doctors determined that vaping had caused extensive lung damage and that he would not survive without a transplant. It's unclear which vaping products the teen was using. Doctors say his prognosis is now good, but he's got a long road to recovery. The, there was an enormous amount of inflammation and scarring, uh, in addition to multiple spots of dead tissue. And the lung itself was so firm and scarred, it was literally we had to deliver it out of the chest. So this is something that I personally, this is an evil that I haven't faced before. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the chemical compound vitamin E acetate has been identified as a strong culprit in connection with vaping-related illness. Don Cherry has lost his job for remarks that have been labeled divisive and racist. He's refusing to apologize, and today Cherry says he has nothing to apologize for. The 85-year-old hockey commentator says that he has been misinterpreted, and he stands by every word. And his audience remains divided over the comments and his fate. CBC's Simon Dingley has more. Don Cherry is doubling down, refusing to apologize for his remarks on Coach's Corner last Saturday. Speaking with Jeff Samet on Sirius XM Radio, Cherry says he offered to clarify his comments, but says that wasn't enough for Rogers Sportsnet. If I had done certain things that they wanted me to do, uh, I, I could have kept my job. But if I had kept my job and I had a sort of gone out as a gone out as a wimp, and uh, and, and uh, people wouldn't have uh, watched Coach's Corner, they would have said, you know, what a wimp he's turned into. Cherry claims his remarks about Canadians not wearing poppies were misconstrued. I said, you people, and all of a sudden, I, like I said, it could have been Irish, could have been Scotch, it could have been Welsh, it could have been any, anything like that. But they, you know, they jumped on and very sensitive. He takes exception to suggestions Canada has changed and so should he. Canada hasn't changed. It's just that the, the other the people that, that follow me keep their mouth shut. It used to be the silent the majority. It's the silent minority, and they keep their mouth shut. They do not... They do not uh, protest, they do not do this, they do not do that. Mohammed Hussein says Canada has changed. All three of his kids play hockey. I'm really tired of having to convince people again and again that, look, I'm not any different from you. I'm, I'm a Canadian, I love hockey. And there's a backlash, people supporting the ousted TV star. I don't think it was that bad, no. He, may, he gave an opinion and uh, it's freedom of speech here in Canada. A petition has popped up demanding Cherry be reinstated. 
and a Russian hockey team is offering Cherry a job on Continental Hockey League broadcast, tweeting, we need an analyst for Dynamo TV who could talk whatever he thinks. On Sunday, Hockey Night in Canada host Ron McLean apologized for Cherry's comments and for not objecting to them at the time. Cherry says he's disappointed in McLean, but maintains they will remain friends. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Prize of Bigotry. No, those are just some of the friendly faces at this new cafe, which opened today, is run by people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For some, it's their first job. Now, according to the latest findings from Statistics Canada, people with disabilities are less likely to be employed. Less than 60% were employed in 2017, compared to 80% for those without disabilities. After years of working with students with special needs, the owner says it's a dream come true to see her cafe up and running. I'm an educational assistant for the school board, um, so I work with kids with special needs, so I really, already really love the demographic. I find that we lack a lot of real-world opportunities for this demographic, and I just want to give them an opportunity where they are wanted. I want this to be a stepping stone. I want employers to come in here and see how efficient they are and how hardworking they are and how it's about giving them an opportunity where letting them do what they're good at in the environment and just celebrating them. I love this job and I think that it's awesome that I work here and it's good just to come in do some really good stuff here. It's all about being capable and celebrating our lives. I visited a cafe right, side, right outside of Chicago. Uh, it's called Hugs and Mugs. Um, so that cafe is run by adults with Down syndrome. So it's much more of a norm in the States um, than it is here in Canada. And so I want it to become, at least in Windsor, I want it to be something that is more of a norm. I'm very excited and uh, happy to hear that there is another program opening up that kind of duplicates our program here at 10 Friends Diner to service a community that's very diverse, to have a lot of understanding, will help people move forward in their lives. L Lucy, I'm going to say thank you for this opportunity to let me come in and enjoy this beautiful piece of art and um, that you are such a good person and we love you so much. Um, I really love my employees. Um, I really love what I'm doing. It's a dream come true, right? Like it's. That's good stuff. A lot of heart in that story there. Beverly Trillo passed away two days before Halloween, and one of her favorite days of the year is October 31st. Now, over the weekend, her family invited everyone in town to come celebrate Halloween for a second time, knowing how much she loved to see the kids in their costumes. Word spread fast on social media. Hundreds showed up, and we were there. Ooh, we get two. Thanks, Papa. Say thank you. You're welcome. We are uh, celebrating Halloween for my mom and my dad. Unfortunately, my mom fell ill uh, and got, uh, unfortunately, passed right before Halloween this year. And that last week, uh, she was getting more and more upset as time was going on because she knew she, that nobody was going to be at her house to hand out candy like she normally would for the trick-or-treaters. How important was Halloween for your mom? Honestly, it wasn't just Halloween, it was every holiday, but mom just loved watching the trick-or-treaters come through, especially the little, little ones, because as you can see, she never really did the art up super scary. It was kid-friendly. Mom had nine kids, more than 30 grandchildren, more than 20 great-grandchildren. She was very kid-orientated, and she tried to do up her yard that way for everybody to enjoy. So what has it been like for you to see Comber come together like this for you and your family? Great. Yeah. I didn't think there was that many people in town, though. Yeah. A live look here at a developing situation in the downtown core. Westcourt Place, an apartment building 21 stories tall, is being evacuated tonight. The medical officer of health saying that because of a lack of power, heat and water, it's not safe for the hundreds that live there to stay overnight. Now we have our Dale Molnar on the scene. We also have the deputy fire chief. We'll be doing an interview with them next as this story continues to develop. Again, a downtown high rise, a fire this morning forcing the evacuation for hundreds of people tonight.
We continue with a live developing situation here tonight in the city of Windsor. Right in the downtown core, there's a downtown high rise that was evacuated this morning because of a fire. And now the city says that the people need to leave tonight. It is not stay safe to stay inside of the building overnight. Now, our Dale Molnar has been covering this from the very beginning. Dale, uh, you have an update and an interview for us here now. Chris, I'm with Andrea Gian, the uh, deputy fire chief here. Andrea, how, what can you bring us up to speed on the uh, evacuation? Sure. So police and uh, EMS and fire are going door to door uh, with every apartment in the unit, uh, gathering up all of the rest of the people that the residents that are left in there. It's a mandatory evacuation that was ordered by the health unit. So uh, tell me how the people are being evacuated and where they're going. Uh, so right now we've got a reception center set up at City Hall and a secondary reception center set up at the WSU, which is turning into a shelter at seven o'clock. And the people will be bused over there from City Hall to WFCU, uh, fed and given a place to sleep for the night. Some people are just sheltering wherever they can find friends. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we always encourage people to go family and friends first. And then if they don't, then they can certainly go to that shelter. Okay. Are you uh, having some trouble with some people uh, getting out of the building at all? People like to stay in their own homes and they feel that they're willing to tough it out in some cases, but in this case, they don't have an option. It is mandatory. Probably about a couple hundred people here, right? You're not sure exactly how many? Yeah, we don't know. I don't know the exact, you know, resident, the, the full rate of the building itself, but, uh, you know, seven stories of apartments and with 11 apartments per floor, there's a fair number of people for sure. And the WCU Center could handle all these people. Yeah, we're, we've got our partner Red Cross partnership uh, is up and running and they've set up all the cots and are ready to roll over there. Can you tell me what you when you think this building will be back to normal? What you know, because I know they're looking. The end one is in here trying to get the power restored, the heat, and all that stuff. Can you tell me what the problem is, or where with able to figure it out, and when they'll have that back up? So right now we don't know. Uh, the biggest problem is the power and the cold, obviously. Um, they're looking at the equipment. They just need to get a gauge on whether or not it's the actual building equipment, if it's the wiring, or if it's the actual main power equipment for the, the building itself. And that's what they're trying to determine right now. That's really what's going to drive the the, uh, the reopening date of the building itself. Okay. So I guess that's about it for now. It's a for little now. bit, uh, it's a moving target at this point, isn't it? Yeah, lots of moving pieces still, yes. Okay, Andrea did you draw, Andrea, did you, the John, <laughs> it's too cold out here for this. Uh, Deputy Fire Chief of the Windsor Fire Services, Fire and Rescue. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Ms. Dale. The CBC's Dale Molnar live on a developing situation tonight. You can go online. We'll have all of the latest on this as it develops. You heard Dale talking about the cold. We'll look at the snow. This is how many of us started our day digging out. The previously recorded Windsor record for this day was 10.4 centimeters. Now that was back in 1984. Feels like we could have broke that record. We asked Environment Canada, but they couldn't tell us for sure. That's because they no longer track snowfall amounts in this area. They do, however, track the temperatures and we could be in for a record setting night. Uh, joining us now is Colette Kennedy. Colette, it's cold out there. Now, we're just hearing about these people who have to leave their home in the downtown core. Mm -hmm. What are the conditions people are dealing with? Yeah, this is like sort of the worst timing, right, with the weather that we're seeing because we are talking about some extreme cold moving in. Record setting for us. Wow. Now, hey, Environment Canada, in the last decade, there have been changes. There have been reporting stations that closed or that actually were moved. And when that happens, it's hard to say what a record is if you've only got a short short term to look back a few years because it's not at the same point that you were keeping your records from of how much snow fell previously. I don't know if you follow me on that, but that's something else that really happened across the country uh, we've seen. So we do have other means and we have some professionally trained uh, weather spotters who can also measure the snow. We know that, hey, for the Windsor area, just over 19, 19.1 centimeters of snow, uh, similar to Oakville, over towards St. Catharines, they got to hit a little harder, over 20 centimeters there, and you can see some of the other amounts, lesser amounts, but uh, an incredible dumping of snow. But again, that's where it was being recorded. It doesn't mean everyone saw that much snow through the area. 
Now tonight, dealing with the cold. So minus 12 is my forecast low tonight. The current record for the 13th is minus 9.9. .9. So that will be a new record that we're going to be seeing. And yes, we've got a little bit longer. Temperatures are starting to come up. Just to give it another day uh, after that. So Windsor, we're at minus 6. Chatham-Kent, minus 8. And feeling like minus 13 when you factor those winds in. Because of those winds coming across the lake, there are all kinds of snow squall warnings in here, but even some travel advice in the areas in blue and you can see on the radar those squalls those banners kind of coming off here or streamers as we sometimes call them so at times we get a few flurries even towards our skies but primarily we're looking at mostly clearer conditions and as we go through the next little while it looks like Wednesday night as we go into Thursday so we'll see increasing cloud Wednesday and into Thursday we may get a little dusting or a few centimeters minus 12 overnight tonight feeling like minus 18 tomorrow afternoon we're climbing as the winds will shift towards the south closer to getting to the freezing mark and will exceed it when we get to Thursday. So temperatures not where they should be for this time of year. But hey, we'll take some readings, I think, above freezing. Second half of the weekend looking a little bit better. Thanks for this, Clint. You're welcome. Another live look outside. You can see the fire department starting to move here. Firefighters as well. They've been going door to door at a downtown high rise, letting people know that they need to leave their home tonight. The building there inside has been ordered for an evacuation, a lack of power, a lack of heat, and a lack of water. This affects hundreds of people because of a fire that happened earlier this morning. We're going to continue to follow this developing situation and keep you up to date with the details you need to know.
Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sat down with Conservative leader Andrew Scheer today. It's the first time that the two leaders have met face to face since the election campaign and both are looking for areas of cooperation. It's, it's up to Mr. Trudeau to find common ground to get his throne speech passed. Uh, so I highlighted the areas that we would be focusing on, the, the parts of our platform uh, that we believe uh, should be implemented. The Liberals were reduced to a minority government in the election. That means Trudeau will need opposition support to pass legislation. Scheer says it's possible both sides could back tax cuts, enhanced maternity benefits and transit funding. He also said tackling Western alienation was a priority for him. Trudeau is meeting with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh on Thursday. Parliament returns December 5th when MPs will elect a new speaker, followed by the speech from the throne. We go back live to the downtown of the city of Windsor, where emergency services continue to work on the evacuation of the West Court building. Now, this is a 21-story building that was the scene of a fire this morning. It happened just after 6 o'clock when that alarm went off. There was an initial evacuation, and about 45 residents were sent over to City Hall. Now, the medical officer of health is calling for the entire evacuation of the West Court building that could mean hundreds of people. They're going door to door telling them to find shelter with friends or family. And they're saying that emergency cots and other supplies are available at the WFCU Center. We'll be keeping a close eye on this situation. You can follow it all at cbc.ca slash Windsor or on our Twitter and Facebook accounts. Thank you very much for watching. And we leave you here with a shot once again of the downtown core where a high rise is being evacuated.